Welcome to the block party. My name is Seth Kushner coming off a big win last night. I mean, probably one of the biggest wins that you can have the lightning moving out of the Stanley cup final. This interview would have sucked today. If the lightning lost, I am joined by ESPN's John Bucci grass, Bucci man. What's going on, dude. Good to see you. Congratulations. Uh, three in a row. I'll be heading to Denver Tuesday to begin ESPN's coverage and uh, great to be part of the Stanley cup final again. Last time was 2004 when ESPN had hockey and the Lightning won that Stanley Cup. They beat the Calgary Flames in seven games. So kind of a deja vu. 18 years later, we get hockey, and who's in the Cup final again but the Tampa Bay Lightning? I just heard I just heard you say we're going to win the Stanley Cup, so I think that all makes <laughs> That's all you heard. I, I think that's all that, that's all makes By the way, okay, can I ask you, have you checked on Mark Messier? Do we know how Mark Messier is doing? Because at, at the start of the ECF, he looked like a proud father. And then even, you know, tied up 2-2, he still felt pretty confident. And now, and now I don't know where he is. Is he wandering the streets? Is everything okay? Because <laughs> it seemed like he was all in on that team going all the way. Yeah, he was, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see him on the road in Denver and then in Tampa Bay. And um, you know, obviously uh, Vancouver Canuck, Edmonton Oiler, New York Ranger. But yeah, the New York Ranger part seems to be sticking to him a little bit more. Uh, he lives in the area, lives just outside New York. And so, uh, so yeah, he was, uh, he was pretty invested and in, uh, <laughs> in those Rangers, it was, it was quite a run. Um, I don't think anybody expected them to get this far. I think they have, I think the future bodes well for them for the rest of this decade. You, know, you look at the teams in the Eastern conference who are starting to kind of rise. You know, I, I look at them and probably Toronto as the two teams, you know, what's going to happen these next five, six, seven years as the lightning, obviously, slowly age out a little bit who knows maybe they'll reload and figure it out and keep going especially with the goalie's only 28 i mean geez you have five to seven more good years of him yeah so uh their window is certainly not closed yet and um but for those other young teams they're certainly i think at the top as the penguins probably go backwards the capitals probably go backwards the bruins probably go capital I mean, backwards you get replaced it's probably Rangers and Maple Leafs looking forward. I want to talk about somebody that you were tweeting about uh, the last couple of games, and that's Andre Pallad. And you were talking about all the incredible things that he's done in this postseason. And something I, I wanted to bring up is, I'm sure you know, obviously, everybody, I think every team in the NHL, I feel like had a chance at Andre Pallad this offseason. I feel like anybody, if they would have offered any sort of asset to JBB, I feel like he would have taken it for them to unload the salary. It was a big deal for them mm -hmm. to finally unload Tyler Johnson. And it was like, okay, nobody wants our first liner. That's fine. We'll just take him and figure it out again. What has impressed you so much about Pilat? Yeah, boy, he's really stepped up. When, they're, when they went down 0-2, uh, the way he gets the puck along the wall and just makes a play with, with real force and energy, obviously he finishes in a big moment. Um, obviously he's very well respected and, and liked throughout the league. People don't really mess with him. When he shows up, everything kind of just diffuses. He has so much respect from his peers, kind of like that – Nicholas Lindstrom quality that he always had. Uh, so it's a great position to, to be in as a player. Players probably won't make cheap runs at you. Uh, you still got to play physically, but just his all around game. And I mean, the pass he made, you know, last night to Kucherov, who then fed Stamkos, that was just an absolute dime, uh, about a hundred foot pass. And uh, so, yeah, he, I, I talked about it. He's probably the most under the radar, unrestricted free agent. Um, I still wonder if there's a path to stay in Tampa. If they give him a lot of term, can they keep the number down around five? Because you know, why wouldn't they keep a guy like him around for five million a year? How are they going to do better than that? Well, listen, I don't know anything. They don't tell me anything here. I'm the last person to know. I, you know, I normally get my sources from like the security people at Emily, but I, I feel like the move that they made for Hagel um, was probably a move to replace Pilat. And I, and I think mm -hmm. hopefully now the big, they're going to probably look to re-sign Nick Paul. I think that's probably going to be something they look to do. By the way, John, how did they get Nick Paul? How did they get Nick Paul for Matthew Joseph? And this guy looks, I mean, his nickname is Nick Paul does it all. I talked to the kid. Uh, he's a hell of a guy. And, and now he is absolutely playing the kind of hockey that wins you playoff games. How did the lightning just get him under the radar? That is amazing because, you know, people were talking about him all year. I didn't understand why Ottawa, a, a team who's kind of on the rise, could use a player like that. He was he won't be that expensive. You know, he's not a real dynamic offensive player. He, he's, a lot of times you'll see he has low assist totals for a reason, I think. He's not the greatest playmaker. Maybe he can learn that. But the way he shuts people down at the end of games, the way he, he shadowed Austin Matthews in the Maple Leaf series, he was so noticeable last night, winning battles, clearing the puck, Ice on the PK, you know, the net's empty. You want him out there. 
um, a guy who can make one-on-one moves. And I think he'll probably continue to be better and better at that as he continues to learn moves. Maybe he can become a 15 to 20 goal guy, but he certainly has a lot of value. And, uh, and the price probably might've gone up a little bit on him, not a lot, but a little bit because of how he's performed in the postseason. Let's face it. You, you know, when you build a roster, you really primarily build it, you know, first to make the playoffs, but then to do well in the playoffs. And he seems to be a guy who's going to be a playoff guy. Like you said, almost like a Palat uh, as well. You mentioned Hagel. I thought Hagel's best game as a Lightning was last night. I did not see him with that kind of energy and that kind of pop all year long. A kind of a shy, introverted guy. But now he's all in. We saw, I watched Quest for the Cup on ESPN+. Plus. Great feature. I got caught up the other night, watched every episode. And at one, in one of the games, he introduced the starting lineups and he was really screaming and yelling. And you can see now he's starting to get comfortable with the team. Nick Paul just shows up and he's, I'm ready. I'm comfortable. But, you know, for some other people, it takes a while. I think it took Hagel a while. And boy, last night, the way he, Sorelli and Kaloran played, and I think it's good that they didn't score last night. They are so due to score. If they can pop in the final, you know, Kaloran hasn't scored. Sorelli has no five on five goals. Um, Hagel's got the empty netter. Man, if they can get that line going with Palat, Stamkos, Kucherov, now they're starting to get layers again. And if they get point back and they get Perry back to the fourth line, which I think he's better at because he's putting too much pressure on himself to score when he gets slotted up. Yeah. You can see it on the power play the other night in game five. It's like, I, I don't want to shoot now because I have all these great chances and I'm not putting it in. So, man, they're sneaky in a good position here if they get point back. Is this is this crazy? I, I want to talk about some of the crazy things you've done in your career. But it, to me, this is I feel like there's so many different like statistics and records going on here. It's hard to grasp two things. Obviously, Pat Maroon going to his fourth straight Stanley Cup. And now you've got Corey Perry going to his third straight Stanley Cup. Like these are these are crazy things, right? You you probably are so happy. You've got enough storylines for two yeah. years now. Yeah, well, you know, Perry's third different third straight cup three different teams that's only happened one other time you know in the history of the league that was hosa when he tried the penguin red wing and then finally the blackhawks he got the win and now perry's okay now perry's different because he's already won a cup he's got a heart trophy he's won a cup with anaheim you know a million years ago it seems but if there's anybody who lives hockey and just that face is just a hockey face (laughs) every every year is is life or death for him. It doesn't matter if he'd won five cups, he's still going to go out there and it's life or death for him. Those are my favorite kinds of athletes. We know it's not life or death, but it has to be kind of like life or death. That's why Stamkos is blocking shots now. That's why Sergachev gets in front of any puck at his young age, hasn't really made his big contract yet. But he, and that's another guy who's really popped the last two games. Scoring that goal must have given him such a shot of adrenaline because last night he was a monster last night, eating up ice and defending, blocking any kind of shot. Um, so it, it's really amazing how they, like I said, Hagel rose up, Sergachev rose up. Um, Stamkos has been so consistent throughout this postseason. I got him now slightly above Kucherov as the number one Lightning con Smythe guy if they go on to win. Um, just uh, really impressed by Stamkos. I think he really elevated his reputation throughout the league, the respect as a player. And he's, he's really kind of, you know, he's always, always put up the big numbers, but he got kind of pigeonholed as a stationary one time, just slot machine kind of guy. But now he showed the complete game this postseason. Wow. So people, I mean, I know a couple of people around the league. Some people thought that Stammer was washed up and, you know, because of the injuries like that, I had heard yeah. people actually say that. I mean, was, was that the thought that Stammer was on the, the decline because this is the best year of his career. Even before they won, even before they started going on this run, which he, you know, granted, he really wasn't a part of in the end. Um, even before that, when they weren't winning and getting swept by people kind of looked at him was like, nah, I don't know. He just kind of stays in one spot. He waits for the one timer. Doesn't play a 200 foot complete center game. You know, move to the wing a little bit. Now, just like I said, on, on that offside and a one timer. Now he is just, and, and part of it might've been health or part of it. Sometimes you just get stagnant. It's like, what are we doing? What is the right position for him? And then, you know, to, for Coop to first to get healthy and then Coop put him back in the middle. I just think he took on that challenge and he just, in his career really does remind me of Steve Eiserman as in their twenties, they're accumulating stats. You try to accumulate stats, you try to accumulate money. And then as you, you start to get towards 30, you realize, you know, geez, I haven't won yet. I've always tried to win, but you know, for whatever reason, it's just, you're re, you're building back up. And those organ, not everyone's like, you know, if Sidney Crosby got drafted and, you know, Mary Lemieux was there and then Malkin's right behind him and they're good right away. He never really had to, 
to do what Eisenman did, what Stamkos did, what some of these, what McKinnon had to do, what McDavid's doing, where they had to try to grind and grind. Now they're in the league seven, eight, nine years. And they still haven't won yet. And for them, they haven't won a trophy of any significance since they're like 15, you know? And so it, it, that starts to really weigh on a guy like that, especially an elite athlete who is just far and away better than everyone else. So I, I think Stammer, he, he was getting that slight reputation of just being a goal scorer stat accumulator. And, and now it's, it's, it's really fun to watch. I've been a big fan of Stammers for a long time. Ever since he came into the league, I had a chance to interview him. I did a radio show and they brought him in when he was 18, you know, and I followed his career ever since. And, you know, one thing about Stammer, even when he's been injured that I don't think a lot of people would talk about is just everything that he does off the ice, you know, for the players, when he's around the guys, he tries to help everybody grow. He's the first one to reach out to guys when they're, you know, traded or signed to the team. And I really learned that about him and learned that he's trying to do everything he can to help this team. If, even if he can't be out there on the ice. So to see him now dominating on the ice, and just having it all come together and now like you're talking about you know it's kind of like he's getting the respect he deserves it's, it's really an awesome thing he's like he's a great guy he's a man for all seasons i could see him being the president of the lightning <laughs> one day i could see him being the gm i could see him being the lead analyst on espn he'd be a great tv analyst he looks great he sounds great he's thoughtful i could see him being the commissioner of the nhl i, I, I mean really that's that's how much i respect his mind his his empathy, how he can read a room, um, his presence that he's now starting to build because now he is, you know, he's unquestionably really kind of, when you have that many players, it's hard to kind of figure out who's a leader. Even when Gretzky's Oilers, you know, Messier was still the guy who would fight and, and obviously fears in net and coffees on the back end. It's, Wayne was still the great one, but there's, there was a lot going on there. So when you have a team like that, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to stand out. I'm sure Stammer felt that same way. I mean, Vasilevsky is going to the Hall of Fame. Kutroff is going to the Hall of Fame. Hedman's going to the Hall of Fame. But now he's really kind of kind of nudge his way to the front of like, this is kind of my team. I'm setting the tone. Um, I've become kind of the heartbeat because of my mind and how I can talk and how I can sound bite. I can send a message. I can perform on the ice as well. That's the most important thing. So he is really... I, like I said, I really think he has stepped forward in the game in a multitudes of way this year. And like you said, it began with getting healthy. It began with having great teammates that helps too, and have a coach who's really understands people. I mean, Cooper is an absolute savant when it comes to understanding people. So it's just, it's now a perfect storm of talent, organization, ownership, uh, the coach. And now, like I said, I really do think Stammer's kind of nudge his way to the front and he is really the leader of this team. Man, Bucci, I could listen. I'm all fired up. I could talk about the lightning all day. We're going to come back to it because I want to talk about some of the things you've done in your career. Um, whose idea was it to thumb wrestle the rock back in the day? Was that your idea? Was that a, <laughs> was that was that a producer? Because that's brilliant. That's a good question. Yeah, because those producers are obviously really good. I can't remember whose idea that was. That's a that's a that's a great question. I wish I would have known. But yeah, that was fun doing that. I did that afternoon. I've mainly been a nighttime sports center anchor for my 25 years. But for three years there, I did the noon to three. And that was really a great break for me at ESPN. Three hours a day, Monday through Friday. Like you said, people like The Rock, Vince Vaughn, all kinds of people would come in promoting stuff back then. And, you know, and I don't know how much what my bosses thought of me back then. But when you're on noon to three, you know, everybody at work at ESPN, that's when everybody still went to work. And a lot of people at ESPN, they don't have their TVs on, obviously, you know, the TVs on sports centers on all day. And I think they realized, well, that guy's not bad, you know, because so it was almost like a three hour day audition. I kept building up moments like thumb wrestling with the rock or I played paper football with Adam Vinatieri and we put snow effects and he kicked a field goal and I had him sign my paper football and, oh, wow. and just little things like that. A lot of creativity and fun. And so I think that really helped kind of, you know, have me stick around. And then when we really started to get back in our intention with getting back into hockey, we failed in the last contract. We made a great offer, but NBC had the right to match five years ago. And so I think they realized, okay, we're going to do this. Let's keep this guy around because he's one of the hockey guys we have here. And that's helped me stick around for 25 years. Well, you've, you've done a hell of a job and that's why you have stuck around. So when ESPN gained the rights and obviously brought in a slew of talent, tell me, has there been anybody that you've kind of connected with or clicked with that they brought in that, you know, you had it before? Yeah, that, that's, and that's the true blessing. You know, Sports Center is such a big giant giant Walmart kind of a thing. It's just so big and spacious. Lots of people don't work with the same people. The intimacy of the hockey group that we now have is really right up my alley. It's really enhanced my job, my life. And so, yeah, so meeting people like Ryan Callahan and I have really hit it off. Um, really enjoyed, you know, working with him and, and trying to both of us get better. 
at our new jobs, me as a play-by-play guy, really for the first time in the NHL. You know, the first game I ever did was opening night this year in Las Vegas, you know, Seattle and Las Vegas. I was surprised they asked me to do it. Um, been doing college for 15, 16 years with the hope of getting a play-by-play reputation and game to take to the NHL. And thankfully that's now happened, but Ryan's been, Ryan's been great. Uh, Kevin Weeks, you know, I've been on a little bit, been great hanging around him. John Tortorella has been really fun to get to know Torts and have him text me sometimes while this game is going on and he'll just blurt something out. It's so funny to me. And uh, so, yeah, and, and even, you know, AJ Malesko just love being around AJ and so much respect as a gold medalist and national champion at Harvard and Patty Kaz, which is their Hobie Baker Heisman Trophy Award. So, uh, so many men and women uh, to, to, uh, at EF, with this hockey group. It's been such a blessing. Most people, if they're at their same job for 25 years, they're kind of they're kind of counting down the days to when they can leave. I feel like I'm just starting again. So to, to have that kind of infusion of enthusiasm at, after being in one place for so long at my age, I mean, that, that's a great blessing. Well, and, and I love Ryan Callahan. What kind of future do you think he has in TV? Do you think the sky's the limit for him also? I do. Like I, I, I keep trying to tell him, you know, Ray, I mean, Ray Ferraro certainly is, is one of the best in the game right now. And I keep trying to tell him, go back and listen to Ray when he was in his first or second year at ESPN back doing NHL tonight with me back in 1999, 2000, he wasn't Ray Ferraro yet. You know, he, it, it takes time. And, and so Ryan has the analytical uh, brain that uh, Ray has. He has the passion and fire uh, that Ray has. He can turn on a dime in terms of emotion and temper, like Ray does, <laughs> they're very similar. You know, uh, you know, one's got an Irish name, one's got an Italian name, but sometimes the Irish and Italian are, are more alike than they are different. <laughs> and so I like those passionate people who run hot. Ryan can run hot. Ray can run hot. And so I like being around those kinds of people. So I, I know that the, the executives at ESPN have a lot of uh, confidence in Ryan's potential. I think you'll see more of him as the years go along, as long as he wants to keep doing this keep doing TV. He could be an assistant coach tomorrow if he wanted to do that. But yeah, you can make probably more money in TV and, and not work as hard than the yeah. assistant coach. So, unless you want to be a, a head coach and make that real big money. Uh, I don't know why you would be an a, assistant NHL head, uh, an, an, an assistant NHL coach, unless you have bigger aspirations. Tell me what it's like when you're receiving a text from Tortorella about a hockey game. Cause to me, Tortorella's I've never seen, I don't see him as a regular guy. Every player I've ever interviewed does, you know, they don't like, they don't go like, Hey, you know, I was joking around with torts. It's all very serious type stuff. Uh, yeah. He, is he, is he a regular guy or what? No, no. He, I, I, I see what they're saying. There is always, he's always buttoned up a little bit. You know, he's always kind of on edge, always uh, <laughs> very kind of like a, you know, his son's in the military. And um, I don't know if he kind of got that late and kind of respected his son so much in his life that he kind of wants to have that same persona a little bit, but he's fun. He's, you know, I, I can make him smile. I can make him kind of, you know, come on. And I, I'll call him out on his stuff because, you know, we're, we're close to the same age. And like I said, I'm, uh, he's not, no one's going to intimidate me anymore. So it's like, torts, read the chicken parm tweets. He's like, okay. <laughs> so it's fun. You can call him out. He likes to be, he likes, he wants to be one of the guys in the group. Um, at the same time. So it's, he's got a very interesting mind, but no, his, his texts to me at night usually are just real quick burst of this. They got to do this or see, I told you, or they're going to do this. They can't, you know, it's really fun. He's really fun and direct. I hope he get, you know, I wish another guy is really good on TV. I wish he'd retire from coaching and just work with us because he'd be awesome. But um, I think he, you know, he wants to get back into coaching. I think he'll get one of these jobs that are open. Um, and so we'll probably lose him. But uh, and the, so I'm hoping that's not the case, but it's been great to get to know Torts. Really enjoyed him. Does, does Torts take any bit of, of pleasure for potentially being the reason why the Lightning have gone off on this run? When I talked to Coach Cooper, he said he doesn't think the Stanley Cups happen if they don't get swept by Columbus. Um, does Tortorella go like, hey, yeah, yeah, I feel like this is a little part of that Cup's mind. I'm sure nothing like that. But does he take oh, yeah. any? What, what are his thoughts on it? Yeah, well, there's a great article in The Athletics that just came out, and uh, that was a big quote they used as the headline was, we created a monster, meaning the Columbus Blue Jackets sweeping uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, caused them to be introspective. That's one thing, but then to act on it, and then to act correctly. You're still going to get the right players. you still got to identify what you did, then identify the plan, and then get the right players, whether that be a little bit of luck and a little bit of scouting, because um, the right players aren't always available. But um, but yeah, that was a, that's a great article on the Athletic, and uh, and that was one. And they obviously talked to Torts about it because that's the last playoff series they lost. The Lightning getting swept uh, in the opening round, 
um, by the Blue Jackets. And so basically that was his quote, we created a monster. <laughs> and and uh, so far he's right. This is three straight cup appearances in the hard cap salary cap era, you know, that hasn't happened before. And um, so, yeah, so Torts I think does, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure he's using that in his interviews and talking about that and um, as a, his plan for whatever organization he's, he talks to that this is how we'll do it too. Listen, I got to tell you, you have a you have a beautiful beard and I know that you didn't early in your career and it seems it's been a seamless transition. Is that like some guys just show up with a beard and they're like, oh, my God, but this just seems like if they just put your face up and they computer generated it and then they, they <laughs> aged you, this would be like the perfect face. How's the beard gone over? Is it something that you embraced? And when did you decide that, like, I have to roll with this on TV now? Yeah, it was back. My son had just graduated from high school in 17. He was heading down to Florida to take a gap year because he wanted to play college golf and he had grown up playing hockey for eight months, nine months out of the year, never really had winters to play golf. So a little behind the curve, physically also a late bloomer like I was. So I said, why don't you go to Florida for a year? Just, you know, just, just, just take a year off of school, practice golf and, you know, grow, try to eat. And so I went down there and as it turned out, I, I had taken some vacation time in August and September. I didn't realize I took them right next to each other. So I had like four weeks vacation for the first time in my life. And I don't think because the ESPN probably does a month at a time. They didn't notice. They gave me the last two months of August off and the first two months of September. Jeez. So I realized when that, I was like, oh, this is really cool. I've never had this before. I've been grinding here all these years. So I took him down there and I was like, you know, what? I'm not going to shave just because, you know, I haven't, haven't not done that either. So, and then the hurricane hits down, the hurricane Irma while yeah. we're there. And so it's like, okay, so I just kind of let it go, not thinking about it. And then I start noticing people start giving me compliments. It's like, well, I really like that. I really like that. I really like that. Like, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't never thought, I didn't do it for looks. I just think I didn't want to shave. And then I realized, okay, my, the beard is gray. Now I, now I got to admit, I've been coloring my hair like Dick Clark since I was about 35. I would have been gray at a very young age. But I figured out TV, I can't be gray in TV. But I realized, well, I can't have gray hair and I'm coloring my hair. I can't. So, but I get so many compliments about the beard. I'm keeping the beard. That's not going. Good. So I said, I'm a, I'll let the hair go now, you know? And then, so that slowly went, you know, brown and then little salt and pepper and then where it is now. And, and, uh, and the, and people just again, people, I, I looked at it. I watched my game film on TV. Okay, that looks fine. And so yeah, so it all just kind of happened mainly because I chose not to because I had those all those weeks vacation and it came in. They liked the beard, but it was gray. So then, it, so yeah, and now I wish I would have done it ten years ago. Well, I'm I'm glad something positive from Hurricane Irma, you know, happened to you. I yes. ended up I, I ended up fleeing with my four month old baby from Tampa to Atlanta. We drove 13 hours. It was out of gas. I thought that we were all going to die. We had our dogs in the car. I was panicking. I was a new father. You know, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. I was like, let's get this kid out of here and go to Atlanta. So I'm glad something. <laughs> I'm glad your beard came out of that. Uh, I'm I'm yes. a I collect all sorts of like baseball, football cards. And I noticed that you have your own card. It's from, I don't know what, like you got an upper deck and then there's like a Goodwin champion or something like that. Some yeah. are autographed. Tell me about like, did your agent bring this to you? Did they approach you? And what's it like to have your own trading card? Yeah, well, I don't have an agent. I'm, I'm my own agent. I'm one of the few who don't. So uh, yeah, a, a friend of mine who was in the agent business says, yeah, this I got this thing, this Bowman or Tops or upper deck. The first one I did. And yeah, and they sent like a hundred cards, you sign them all. And then obviously sign some sort of contract because now I see all these other cards with different pictures. They must lift from Google images or something. Cause uh, I was like, okay. The one time I sent in a golf shirt and they cut it up and they put it into some of the cards because you know, those are valuable. But I also grew up collecting baseball cards and football cards, hockey, basketball. I got a pretty extensive collection go back to the fifties and sixties and seventies. Cause I started young and then started buying my friends cards. So I, I got a good head start in the sixties. And then we go to baseball card shows, my dad and I. And so I, I built up a lot, a pretty good collection. And so, yeah, it was pretty cool when they did that. And I, was, I still get them in the mail. And pe these people know what to do. They send a self-addressed stamp envelope and I sign it. And so, yeah, they, they still come trickling. It's pretty cool because, like you said, I was a big baseball card guy. And then, you know, because like when when I, even when my kids start playing youth sports, that's when, like, the baseball hockey cards start happening for, like, little leaguers. And like, if I would have got that when I was a kid, that would have been the biggest thing in the world. But, you know, now there's so many of them in the, the sport uh, or the, the industry, obviously overproduced in the early nineties. That's when yeah. I kind of lost, that's when I kind of lost interest. And, um, and so at some point, you know, I got, you know, I got the Gretzky rookie set and the Jordan rookie set and Tom Seaver, 1967 tops going back to 58, 56 baseball. So I got a pretty good collection and, uh, 
and um, and the seventies and football, all those rookie years with LT and Elway and Marino in the eighties. And so, yeah, I've always enjoyed cards. So to get your own, especially when it's a good picture, it looks good. And, and uh, you know, it, it's fun to get those. The ones that you don't like, oh, I don't like that picture. I wish that didn't exist, but you know, what are you going to do? It's crazy. So you mentioned that you sent in like one of your golf shirts that get cut up for people that don't know. Like, I think I got like right here, like a yeah. Marty, Marty saying the week card and it's got Jersey like, card, yeah, yeah, Jersey jer card, right. People don't know that they cut up jerseys, shoes, like Anything. bats, ball, like helmets, pucks, like, and they, they put that stuff in cards and that's why the demand is so high right now. Yeah, so, and anything to create scarcity, right? That, that, yeah. That's what, that's what, in any industry, any economy, you're trying to create scarcity. That's Bitcoin. That's, and that's in, in the card business. Yeah. You, I sent a pair of jeans once and they cut those up and put them in a card <laughs> and occasionally, I'll, yeah, a pair of jeans. And actually, the, the golf shirt I sent in was the golf shirt that I got a hole in one on a par four that I, I, I was wearing a, the, the shirt that I wore when I got my ace on a par four. I don't like to talk about that. As you can tell, <laughs> I sent that shirt. And so if anyone ever gets a, go, a, 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 a card with me with the golf, I think it's like a pink salmon colored shirt. I think it's salmon. That shirt was uh, with a hole in one. I don't, I don't think they really advertise that in the in the car. They probably should have pointed that out a little bit more. But yeah, that, that was a good one. I gave that one up for the people. Well, listen, when I see you in Tampa, I'm going to come to claim a pair of your jeans and a pair of your shirt, you know, some there shirts. Go. And I, I'm going to just start cutting them up and selling them on the black market. Yeah, you I'll, know, I'll, I, I'll, bring, I'll bring an extra pair for you. I got plenty of golf shirts, so I can give you plenty of golf shirts. <laughs> Thank you. Uchi, all right, listen, I could I could talk to you forever. I don't want to I don't want to take up any more of your time because I, I really appreciate it. One last question. I have not been paying attention to anything that's been happening on the West Coast for the last three years. Can you please <laughs> tell me about the Avalanche? I know that they've been a favorite to go to the cup final for the last few years. It's finally happened. So to give me kind of your your take on this Stanley Cup final. Yeah, this would be the best team, obviously, that the Lightning have played this postseason. Um you know, Nathan McKinnon is an absolute freight train. You know, they haven't seen anything like him yet uh, this postseason. Um, Kale McCarr, you know, they haven't seen anything like him yet this postseason. They have depth up and down the lineup. You know, Nashuskin, Burakovsky, they got these kind of guys who have been around six, seven years now, know how to play, kind of found their game. Nashuskin is another UFA to be who's going to cash in big for someone this year. Um, but you know, the question they have is in net, you know, even if Darcy Kemper was a hundred and hundred percent healthy, it could head to head with Vasilevsky. And that's what the cat does that the later these series go, he just gets, he shuts it down. They shut it down. And I really do think that Tampa Bay has a chance if they get, um, obviously, you know, Colorado's open up as the favorite as, you know, as they should, um, because of McKinnon and McCarr. And again, Rantanen is like, he's that guy, like when Kucherov first came in the league three, four years, I'm like, this guy's my favorite player. You guys don't know how good this guy is. That's kind of Rantanen. Like he's that good is big giant guy who can pass and shoot. And then of course, Landis Gog is another one of those character guys. So they, they have a, they have four good lines, but if Kadri's hurt, you know, if that wrist or thumb he broke is not good, you know, Cagliano, he just skates. So his, his thumb injury isn't as bad. But the cold tending question, the cadre injury, this is going to be a real good series. I think it's going to be a long series. And, and the longer it goes, we know it benefits the, the Lightning. So if they can just, you know, take, I'm glad they won that second series in four and this one in six, give them rest because Colorado's had a lot of rest as well. So the rest, not as big as a factor as Tampa grinding down the Rangers, you know, with back-to-back -back seven game series. So I think the rest is kind of even goalie edge, Tampa Bay experience, Tampa Bay. So this is going to be a great one. I think. Okay. Listen, you've got me, you got me all hyped up. I need, I got to need one more question. One more yeah. question. You brought up Kucherov talking about early on, like this is my favorite player watching Kucherov. And cause you're a worldly man, you know, about all sports, you know, watching Kucherov on the power play pass, is it's artwork to me, like just watching him look and know, and he can see where everything's happening all way before it even happens. Is there anything you could compare that to in any other sport where you can just watch one guy pass or, or just something that's just so beautiful that that doesn't really like, I, I don't know. I'm, I was trying to talk to my friend the other day and I couldn't describe, couldn't compare it to anything yeah. in football or basketball or baseball, just watching the guy work out there. Yeah, and no, I know what you mean. And that's one reason why I, I don't like basketball as much anymore because it's kind of turned into an LA fitness three point shooting contest. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, they're, they're shooting 40, 50 threes. And, and what I grew up, I grew up with Larry Bird, like you said, just making those passes, those little subtle, sublime plays that, that bring me joy. Like even last night, Kutroff made this unbelievable move behind his own net. It was just a breakout pass, but it was just complete art and just beauty. And actually, Ferraro, 
came out and actually said something like there's not too many guys who can make that play while the play was still going. And when I do play by play, I try to point out stuff like that. I try to point out the sublime, the subtle, the Kucherov artistry, not just a goal. Like, yeah, you know, that's why I, I really like to focus on that. So, you no, know, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's like a soccer player probably who just makes a simple little eight foot pass in the middle of the field. doesn't lead to anything, but that moment there, is a moment as a fan that I get joy from and entertainment from not just the end result all the time. So I actually wish Kucherov would shoot a little bit more. I think he's getting a little too pass happy because he's, you know, he just, lo- I think he's entertaining himself out there. He's playing, he's playing for himself, which is what you should do as an artist, right? He, the way he attacks triangles in the neutral zone, boop, 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 hello, goodbye. You know, these guys coming at them with their stick in front of them, like a triangle, two legs. And, and he just, he attacks those things. Just amazing to watch. He's his confidence with the puck right now is, off the charts he is playing with no tension at all like i said sometimes that can be a little scary if you're cooper with a turnover in your own end and i wish he would shoot a little bit more he's got such a great shot one timer but right now he's looking just to dish he loves does not have a lot of five on five goals as i tweeted last night he's got six in his last 40 games five on five goals like you know they need they need more out of him five on five in this next series like he's got to bring it up a notch and i think that includes shooting and not overpassing because this team is fast. And if you have a shot in this series, you got to take it. Bucci, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I am glad that we could have some, you know, talk about Cooch and his art of passing. It is a beautiful thing. And I'm glad that you like to point those things out. When you are down here in Tampa, I will be there. I'll be claiming your golf shirts, jeans, anything that I can <laughs> potentially sell. Make sure you bring it. And looking forward to having you, man. And thanks so much for the conversation. Great job today. Yeah, I love South Florida, and uh, I say, wait, can't wait to get down there for games three and four, and then hopefully for six, too.